Take Hawk 45 here. Now I have a machine gun. Ho <laughs> ho ho. <laughs> what did I tell you? Specifically, an empty M16A1. And actually, I don't have a machine gun. John does, but he let me borrow it. Yes, a transferable M16A1, all intact, original. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Transferable simply means that uh, if you're legal, then John will explain some of that later. You can, you can buy a handgun, and you can afford one of these things, you can buy one. You know, as long as it's a machine gun that was made or imported, I think, after or before uh, 1968, and uh, it was registered before the Hughes Amendment in uh, 1986, uh, May or whatever that is. Okay, so it's kind of a framework for that. But yeah, they're like a piece of real estate. They really are. Unfortunately, there's only X number of them that are really transferable. So we'll talk more about that. John will. So we're glad you're here. We're going to talk about the M16A1. It has a lot of history which you don't have time to go into, of course, because we're gonna shoot the thing and have some more fun with it. But I wanna give you kind of an overview of uh, where it fits, where this model fits, a little bit about before this model, and uh, and then a little bit about after, you know, the A2, and then on up to the, the A4, just a little bit about that. Okay, some of you, we figure, are not even uh, familiar with, you know, what an M16A1 is, or an M16 and don't even know about the history at all maybe of, of this rifle or this type of rifle and there there's a lot of great information online about it of course great books you know the black rifle uh my gosh and there's people who go in depth in this uh if you're not familiar go to tim military arms channel uh Tim or uh, ian uh forgotten weapons there's a great channel uh small arms solutions i think the guy's name is chris bartacci he has all kinds of experience sorry if i mispronounced your name but all kinds of great videos on on these and other things and goes into uh great detail okay so we're not going to try to do that of course i don't have a big enough brain to hold all that information but we're going to kind of hit uh, hit the high points and give you a little information about it okay how's that does that sound all right <laughs> and we're going to have fun doing it <laughs> we really are <laughs> That's more important, right? Uh, so, yep, M16A1. And before we go, I want to thank the people that make all this possible. M16A1, like I said, just kind of an overview. And, uh, you know, not going to go too much in depth. No time for that, really, or not enough time. It's, uh, you know, it all started, as, as many of you already know, with uh, Eugene Stoner and Armalite, which was a division of Fairchild Aircraft, okay? And you know, you, oh gosh, you're gonna hate me for this, but I can't, I can't help it. I'm sorry. There is a little bit of a parallel with Gaston Glock here that we just can't really ignore, right? Uh, we have someone who had not made firearms prior to this. I don't think Eugene Stoner had really, but he had a lot of experience with high-grade aluminum alloys and plastics, fiberglass, and all that. Sound like Gaston Glock a little bit. He hadn't made firearms but he had a lot of uh, uh, experience with those kinds of materials too, making other things, and said, I can make a gun, you know, so, you know, in both very brilliant men, I guess, like me. So, anyway, Eugene Stoner, uh, uh, you know, went about designing the AR-10, which was a 308, which we've got some, well, we've got, you know, we don't have any handy, but so he, the AR-10, which you're familiar with, of course, he put together, and it didn't look exactly like this, but it was of these materials, you know, aluminum, fiberglass, and it had a different look about it, of course, and it was in 308, and he went for the military contracts, uh, and uh, it was rejected. I think it was kind of late to, to the game, as we say, right, as, as far as the trials, and so that, that didn't help either. But obviously, there's a lot of resistance. We, th there are people today. You see them in comments, right? Uh, you know, we got the old wood and steel rifles. You know, there are people who just hate anything that's not wood and steel, even yet. So, what do you think it was like in the 50s, 1950s, and 1960? Can you imagine? I mean, people are driving. My gosh. 55 Chevys or 1950 Chevy cars like John's old Chrysler 1954 whatever and while Eugene Stoner is is uh, designing a rifle made out of aluminum and plastic okay 
uh, and hoping the military would take a look at it. There's no internet, there's no cell phones. I mean, it's like the dark ages technology-wise, really. Uh, I was a baby, but yet designing things like this. So this was really more high tech than maybe uh, many of us can even appreciate today, okay? Because we just can't relate to that. Can I shoot it again? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot a couple just to show you. Again, the M16, A1. It has semi-automatic, it has full auto. Let's put it on, well, put it on safe first. Put it around the chamber. Okay, so it should look very familiar to your AR-15, right? <laughs> and uh, let's put it on semi-auto and see if it'll work that way. Oh, I believe it does. How about a bowling pin? <laughs> How about a red plate? Not bad, it'll shoot anyway. Does not have to be in uh, fun mode. Boom. Boom. Works either way, right? Let's put it on full auto and finish it off. <laughs> it was about empty, right? So the M16, pretty cool. Uh, and the thing about it is there are so many different models that uh well or different variations let's say that that you know were put together beforehand and uh it, it wasn't just eugene stoner the the military and a lot of folks were figuring out after world war ii and korea where we use these things right this old garand and this sort of thing eight shots i'm not going to fire it but you know, big old heavy rifle, fired eight big bullets. Uh, they were kind of figuring out that uh, we needed something maybe a little bit lighter, hold more ammo. Of course, it came up the uh, variation of the Garand, the M14. You know, well, that was an improvement. You got a magazine, holds 20 rounds. I think there are even some 25 round mags, maybe higher capacity. And uh, a little different gas system, and just a, a better M1 Garand pretty much uh, and that's really what they were working on and 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 but in process of adopting right and did you know so for several years this is what we made and it's what it was the official rifle and it's what the early troops carried into Vietnam and you know that sort of thing so that's what we were used to and uh, that's what the kind of rifle 30 caliber that had been used but there were there were a lot of studies and uh, pretty interesting reading I won't go too deeply into it but the that really what was more effective, whether we like it or not, whether we like these or we like those, and I like them all, uh, that more volume of fire was actually more effective is what the, the research was showing and looking at battle and that soldiers weren't sniping as much. They weren't uh, you know, in modern warfare, being able to reach out to 800 yards just wasn't really what was getting it done. Uh, it was, you know, most shots were taken at 100 yards, 150, 200, you know. Uh, soldiers were reluctant to even take a shot further away than that. And, and the, the volume of fire was uh, kind of the, the answer, okay. And so you need a lighter bullet, more ammo and all that. So that's what the people were looking at anyway. And, and uh, this kind of you know, met that need, didn't it? So anyway. Uh, so Eugene Stoner uh, with Armalite, they came with the AR-10, it was rejected, and I don't think they were making a lot of money because of that, and Fairchild was losing, and so they, they sold Armalite to guess who? I think it's right here, yeah, Colt. <laughs> Colt. They sold uh, the rights to the AR-15 to Colt, and Colt started making them. Their first one was like the Model 601 or something. And I, you know, I would just uh, confuse you because I'm confused about some of those numbers on, on them. But uh, the 601, 602, 603, 604, 605. And uh, they put one together. And then Colt, of course, being Colt, and they were ahead in military contracts. They were really better at marketing, I guess. And they got them around the world and, and uh, got them in people's hands. And, but, but first, I think it was General Wyman, got Eugene Stoner to design one that was in this chambering, basically. It was based on the Remington 222 Special or whatever, and then, you know, the 223. But they got that in people's hands, especially over in Asia and around. And they loved it. People were just 
really loved it. They didn't care about the AR-10. They loved it and uh, so controllable, so shootable and uh, lightweight and it worked, okay? And so it was kind of off to the races, although the military still was you know, rejecting it. It wasn't really until Curtis LeMay, the Air Force saw it. He saw it shoot some watermelons and he, he really liked it. And they, they had a need to replace the M2, you know, carbines. And so he thought it'd be great for, you know, they were protecting military bases and missile silos or whatever in the Air Force. And so he right away wanted some of them. I think he even put in an order for some and it, it had trouble getting that through. But eventually got some of those out. There were also some other testing organizations that were putting a few of them out there, here and there, sprinkling them. And in the earliest days of Vietnam, they got a few of them over there. I think like 10 or so at one point, the very first uh, uh, into that country in the hands of some of the rangers that were over there, uh, advisors and, and that kind of thing, and uh, in the hands of the South Vietnamese. And everybody liked them, even the rangers so uh, special ops people so but still couldn't get an adoption except the air force air force just really liked it and uh and they, they i guess they were maybe the early adopters I, f I forget but most of this happened in early 60s okay uh, you can get specific dates on all of this but uh in the early 60s that's when you know vietnam was beginning to crank up and some of these were getting out there in different formats and that's and that, that's what got it going. It, it was just kind of a perfect storm in a lot of ways. The military was very resistant to it in a lot of ways, the Army. But they needed rifles, and the early M14s over there were proving to be, eh, you know, big and heavy. And with the wooden stocks especially in the early days, swelling and affecting accuracy, and just, just a big old rifle to lug around. And just with 20 big rounds uh, versus, like, one of these. The AK-47 that they were up against, right? Lots of ammo and intermediate round. You know, so, uh, you know, the AR really probably was the better choice, right? Uh, and, uh, but the early ones, uh, to, to kind of do a little bit of comparison, they didn't have some of the features of the A1. And one thing I, I wanted to point out, the A1, the M16A1, you might think if you just know a little bit, and of course I don't know much more than a little bit myself, but you know that back in Vietnam, they had problems with these, right? That's what put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths for these. Well, it wasn't this one. It wasn't this one. This one came along the A1 around 67, 68. I think it was adopted, okay? It was prior to that. This one really represents the M16A1, the improvements in, in the M16, uh, which involved you know, chroming the chamber and, and those sorts of things, okay, that, that uh, fixed the problems they had early on. And I'll look at a couple of those others that look a little bit more like the early ones. John had this magazine he found. I'm not sure when it was, we saw a couple of dates on there, 83 and a, a 69, yeah, 369. So it's an old mag, you know, still in the wrapper. Maybe it won't work, what do you think? We don't know what to expect, bugs might come out of here. What? <laughs> two wrappers. Well, this might take some of you back that maybe were in Vietnam. Cool. Colt, AR-15. Wow. So this thing was called the AR-15, right? Uh, yeah, for a, a good while. It was really the M-16 as the military designation. Uh, as I understand, it's still really correct to call the whole family of them uh, an AR-15. They really are an AR-15. We think of AR-15 as being the civilian version and M-16 being the military, but uh, AR-15 is what uh, they called it when Eugene Stoner you know, uh, built it in this chamber. Let's put a couple of these in and shoot them. See if this, this magazine that's been in the wrapper for a while will actually work. What do you think? Yeah, pretty cool, huh? So, yeah, the Curtis LeMay really liked it, and uh, there were some strong advocates for it. And it would be, I guess, Curtis LeMay, uh, General Wyman, uh, who else? Well, Robert McNamara, when he became uh, Secretary of Defense, he was interested in it uh, heavily and wanted to standardize uh, one rifle for all the forces. But the only thing was the uh, Air Force, they did not want the uh, uh, <clears throat> forward assist. Air Force did not want that at all. And... Uh, the military did, the army did, 
so you had a couple of different versions early on uh, well you know actually later on because the uh, the uh, Air Force did not want the forward assist at all and didn't have it uh, their, their early version was I think it was called the M16 and the Army's early version before this was the XM16 or what, E1 and it had the, the forward assist at, at, at one point there because the Army really wanted the forward assist so let's see if this new mag works new quote unquote <clears throat> you know what we could do I better take another one we might need it let's go down here and uh, take out these watermelons like I said we want to have some fun with this and <laughs> we just noticed some watermelons down here now before I shoot them I want to uh, just make a, a note promise everybody that Nobody is starving because we went and bought those eight watermelons. There were others there when we left the, the store, okay? Or picked them from the vine. There were others there. So anybody who was starving from watermelon nutritional deficiency, they could have had those, all right? <laughs> Some people need to take a course in Economics 101. Need I <laughs> say more? All right. <clears throat> Let's just uh, take them out. This is for R. Lee Army. We might need to hit them again, just to make sure. <laughs> We're empty, okay? <laughs> yeah, Arlie Army came to me in a dream last night. And uh, knowing Arlie Army as you know him, he didn't ask me to shoot some watermelons because I have an M16. He ordered me to. He said, maggot! Shoot some watermelons with that thing. And so I did. How's that? Okay. So that was in honor of Arlie Army. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, again, so the Army was uh, all the way, going all the way back. And let me show you over here. Uh, the, uh, the early, like the XM-16 uh, e E1s, and I think there was an E2. And, uh, and I'm not all that knowledgeable about all those different models and variations. But they look more like this, <clears throat> even the military model. Maybe they're civilian models. But uh, they were slab, flat-sided. They didn't have the fencing, you know, for the uh, mag release, and uh, just, just, just different. Okay, you don't have the quick release button on that. Don't even have that little boss there with the spring-loaded detent to, you know, for that yet. Uh, neither is mine. This is my A2, quote unquote. But <clears throat> for wow, uh, almost the entire time up into the 80s. Uh, they were still using these old slab side, you know, lowers for these things. And uh, like even this though has the screw, doesn't have the, you know, captured uh, pin or anything. Even though this is technically an A2, it's transitional. I bought it in 83 or 4. Uh, so that's more of what they look like, just like that. And then they began putting, you know, uh, uh, the boss up here and the detent for that. And then, as you see in, uh, uh, well, this one, the A1. You know, by the time you get to this point, you've got that protection there to keep you from hitting the mag, <coughs> excuse me, the mag release when you're not ready to or whatever. You've got the, the fencing, total fencing up here, and of course the spring and the, and the quick release pin there or, or the captured pin. So that was some of, some of the, the looks. If you see uh, maybe a close up of somebody in, I don't know, Vietnam footage or whatever other, uh, or anywhere, and it's 19, I don't know, 63 or four or five, or six or something before the final the a1 it'll probably look a little more like some of these or an air force model would look more like this with no forward assist you know and of course it didn't have the uh the shell deflector yet that, that came later with the a2 we'll talk about that uh so yeah and also i i, I meant to mention the uh they are i think it was ar5 that uh that armor like came up with the early survival rifle for the air force so you've seen one of the i mean henry rifles makes one of those now they have that and uh, that's been passed around a little bit that was for the air force uh but the air force has been a proponent of this they were from early on and uh there were there were some people who were open-minded there were people who were closed-minded uh, uh you know the army was dead set on going ahead with the end 14 project and they pretty much did but then it was finally canceled i think by mcnamara in uh like 63 or something like that said look th this is the ticket this is what we need okay 
And uh, one of the problems, <clears throat> which I haven't talked about, let me get a 30 round mag. Now, 30 round mags didn't come along until I think around 1970 or so. So uh, that's why in Vietnam, you know, the 20s are actually a little bit more appropriate, I guess. But I'm gonna take one down here because we might need it, okay? I've got some, some things down here that need to be shot. I'll put one of these in my pocket in case, okay? This is the fun of having a, a fully auto M16, right? <clears throat> okay, I don't know who put this stuff here, but it looks like it was done intentionally. And uh, it looks like somebody knew that I have a machine gun. Okay, we're on safe. Now, do we want to shoot it semi or full auto? Yeah, let's go full auto. <laughs> wow, it doesn't take long, does it? Good thing I brought another magazine. <laughs> We're empty, I'll get that mag later. Oh man. It, it, it's really fun. It, it's a different sort of feel. If you've ever shot full auto, I highly recommend you get to a rental range somewhere where you can do that sometime. Just pay your fee and do it. It's a lot cheaper than buying one, no doubt about it. So look at the smoke coming off that thing. Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> so when, uh, you know, the, the Colt got hold of this, bought it in 59 from uh, Armalite, then, uh, you know, the marking got better and then just a, 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 a combination of events like the cranking up in Vietnam, getting more involved, not having enough M14s, not being able to build enough of them even if we wanted to stick with that. And then these things being out there, being easier to build more of them, okay? And then having some adv advocates, you know, for it, like LeMay, of course, in the Air Force, uh, you know, McNamara, uh, Wyman, they, they wanted this, okay? And then the people that were getting them really liked them. People that were using them. I know that flies in the face of what you heard because the thing we hear the most is the problems, right? Okay, well, the first problems didn't really occur right away. I think we had been in Vietnam and some, some numbers uh, for a little while, not, not a long while, but maybe it was a year or two. I don't know when all that started happening. But what it went da came down to, by and large, in a nutshell, was uh, they had meant for this to be uh, a shot or the ammo to be extruded powder or stick powder and that's what uh, you know stoner designed it as the cartridge and everything should have uh, stick powder okay which burns differently than ball powder well what happened was they for whatever reasons the military went to ball powder because they had more of it or standardizing things or something so ball powder burns hotter it was harder on the gun more more wear and tear more pressure and dirtier okay and uh, they thought that these were self-cleaning, duh. And basically advised soldiers even, I mean, you don't need to clean this thing. No cleaning kits were provided with them. How brilliant is that? And, uh, and so, and of course the chambers were not chromed early on or anything like that. They chromed some of the early bolts, but they, they discovered after people started having trouble with them, it was an extraction problem. You know, the rounds would stick in the chamber and they couldn't get them out. And the soldiers would be carrying a cleaning rod taped to the forearm here in order to get, the only way to get it out was down the barrel because it ripped through the, the rim. And so they had to go through the barrel and get it out. And how'd you like to, have to do that in a firefight? People are trying to kill you. And uh, that's what happened. Unfortunately, we don't know how many, but some soldiers lost their lives simply because the gun malfunctioned. How horrifying would that be? Your gun won't work. But that's what they figured it out, that it was the powder, it was the, uh, uh, the chamber, sticking in the chamber, of course. And, uh, you know, and the bolt, they just started parkerizing that. It really wasn't a bolt problem. So I think they started uh, part crumbing the inside of the the carrier maybe in the bolt but so they that pretty much fixed that problem because they got in Vietnam and they're in the water and the humidity and the wet and everything well imagine it your rifle your guns what happens to the chamber if you don't clean it it's corroded it gets rusty and you know the rounds don't want to come out of course so you're firing full auto and getting really dirty well once they did they, they did that uh, yeah, voila, I'm sure someone had some hangups, but 
that pretty much fixed it. And that was before this, okay? So, so this represents the fixed version, pretty much. <laughs> Okay, now, I know I've talked about a lot of that pretty quickly. We got a lot of stuff on the table, just kind of showing you the bayonet for this. Uh, you know, the old, uh, uh, there's a, a Vietnam helmet. Uh, we got the old uh, World War II and Vietnam, whatever, 1911 here, 1911 A1. Uh, so just a little uh, table decoration there, some cool guns. And again, we don't have any, you know, like, whatever XM16 A E1s or anything like that. We just got some civilian models that look a little bit like that just to, to show you a little bit of the difference. And uh, and uh, when uh, I'll, I'll show you, kind of give you a little comparison between the A1 and the A2, which came out in the early 80s. First, uh, I think John, this is John's rifle. So I think he should talk about it a little bit. Don't you? Okay, I think he should and maybe talk to you a little bit about the uh, you know, firearms like this, transferable, furable firearms. He's more of an expert on that than I am. So I'm going to cut right now and let John talk to you a little bit, okay? All right, John Hickok here. So like Dad said, this is my machine gun. And I just want to talk about just a couple of things really quick. Uh, I want to tell you about a little bit about the laws about a machine gun and why I'm calling it a machine gun and why we're calling it that and some things without getting too much. I'm not going to get into the political stuff so much, you know, about about with that. That'll be maybe for another video. But, okay, so some of you might be thinking this is not a machine gun. It's not belt fed. So machine gun is a legal term because of the laws around uh, machine guns, which means a uh, any firearm that fires more than one round per pull of the trigger is the basically the definition for a machine gun um, is classified legally in America at least as a machine gun, right? So even though this might be technically a, just a rifle or an assault rifle or some other different types of terminology you might use, legally it is a machine gun, just like with a silencer and suppressor, where silencer is the legal term, suppressor is kind of what we call them. So this is a machine gun and it's a transferable machine gun, meaning that if you live in a state where machine guns are legal, it's most states, it's like 40 or so, in America, 40 states where you can own a machine gun. As long as you can buy a handgun, then you're probably okay to buy a machine gun, right? And the process is basically you find one. There's not that many, um, but there are several, you know, large uh, machine gun retailers you can find online. There's a lot of really small ones. There's like different little networks where guys are just into the hobby and you can kind of get to know certain people that are kind of selling them and stuff all the time. And, and, you know, once you find one, you find the right price. Um, you know, you contact the guy, you buy it, then it has to be uh, transferred from them to your local shop if they're out of state, which normally they are because it's difficult to find them. So you're not likely to find what you want necessarily in your state, but you could. So it has to be transferred just like buying any gun uh, to the local shop, and then it can be transferred from there to you. So the whole process can take anywhere from like seven months to as many as like 15 months. It can take a very long time um, for it to be fully transferred to you before you can take it home. Um, you have to have the paperwork with you. There's no machine gun license. You have to buy the uh, tax stamp. Each machine gun that is uh, legal for a civilian that's transferable has a tax stamp associated with it and it's for each time. So it doesn't matter if you have 30 machine guns, you have to go through it all over again each time you buy one. Um, there's no license for uh, civilians in that in that sense. You can become a dealer uh, or a manufacturer, but if you're just a civilian, um, it's it, every single time. There's no license, and, and even they have to go through a lot of that same exact stuff whenever they are transferring machine guns. So if you're thinking about buying a machine gun, make sure that you know you know the local laws and you you know, look into all that safety. We don't agree with them. You know, I'm just advising you as your legal advisor. <laughs> Uh, you can find yourself in a lot of trouble and just know what you're getting yourself into um, if you're getting into it. And then lastly, before I go, um, one of the, they, they're very expensive because there's a limited number of them because of the um, Hughes Amendment, unfortunately, uh, making that to where no new ones can be manufactured post May of 1986. So that's why they're very valuable. General supply and demand, you know, properties, principles is why that exists, but they are also a uh, really good investment right now. I wish they weren't, but they are a good investment. So if you buy one, uh, you might spend a lot of money on it, but you can get your money back out of it uh, pretty well. So 
uh, there you go. Uh, this definitely warrants like more videos because it's so much information, but, uh, but there you go. M16A1 machine gun. I'll give it back to dad because he's got some more things to tell you about it. Thanks. All right. The ugly guy is back. Uh, John is right. They are, uh, sadly enough, or at least it's sad, the reasons they're a good investment, but they actually are, uh, I know we all talk about guns being a great investment, especially to our spouses, right? <laughs> but the, uh, class three firearms actually are, they're like buying real estate. Okay, a couple things we hadn't shot, and uh, we need to make sure everything gets shot. Uh, let's put, uh, well, let's put one on the paper, or three or four or five real quick. How's this? <laughs> Got to go in full auto to do it quick, though. Yeah. And let's smoke a little pot. We haven't done that yet. <laughs> and that's probably why I haven't made any sense today. Did not start out by smoking pot. You know what I'm going to try to do? Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to hit the animals over there with uh, 223. They're not hardened steel. Uh, I want to uh, just try to demonstrate a little bit. And this is a fairly light one. The A2 is much heavier and easier to control, keep on target. But even with this one, I'm going to try to hit that cinder block. If I feel it coming up, I'm going to, I'll do burst here. I'm going to put it on full auto and try to hit the barrel and cinder block without hitting the buffalo or anything else over there. Okay. Oh, I did. <laughs> I let it get up on the buffalo. The buffalo is actually hard and steel, but you do have really good control. Let me put on this paper again to kind of demonstrate. I mean, you can keep them in a pretty good little group. And if you really, you know, work at it, uh, you can do even better than that. So, uh, how about these guys right here? How was that for full auto? They had one round. <laughs> There's a tip. Uh, full auto is not going to be very interesting if you have one round left, right? So... Let me uh, compare. I might take one more shot, but uh, the last thing I wanted to do was uh, just kind of give you an idea how how the A2 changed. And, and of course, you got all sorts of configurations, right? You you, you see them, and many of you have them. Uh, and one thing I too I forgot to point out before, one of the things that was so innovative about this, of course, was the locking lugs, the multi lug locking bolt. That's what enables you to have an alloy receiver right i mean you know some of you know more about it than i do it's like a benelli i think it like a benelli or uh, or even uh mossberg uh people worry about the alloy receivers well again i pointed that out before if your steel bolt is locking up in steel up here it's steel to steel locking up uh so it's not relying on aluminum and that's why benelli's and mossberg's last forever they are 15. so that was an interesting design also he started out with a 308, so you can imagine a rifle's not very heavy in 308. Now that's going to knock you around a little bit, isn't it? But this straight line, you know, the barrel, the bore, the bolt, right on back through the uh, the, the recoil spring, and and everything, it's all in a straight line and comes straight back at you, unlike a lot of rifles where you got kind of a drop comb and everything. So, so uh, it was probably to our advantage that he started out with a 308 because it made him probably think more about all of that, how important all that would be in a harder kicking round, you know? And then in 223, it's really nice and easy to control, right? Especially in the A2, which brings me to the last topic here, pretty much. So we got an A2 upper here. John has an A2 upper. This is actually supposedly from a, you know, machine gun. Uh, A2 upper, doesn't really matter whether it's from a machine gun or not, but it's uh, from an M16. And you see the differences, and there's some I won't point out necessarily, but the obvious ones, your rear sight, you know, you can adjust. You've got this separate uh, block here where you can, you know, you can adjust windage and elevation from the rear. On the A1, this is, you know, of course the A1, you can uh, adjust uh, windage, but elevation you got to do out here on the front sight. So that was a real improvement. Real, just a nice sight, you know. Uh, the A2 was a big improvement. It really was. And you see some other differences here. You've got, of course, your uh, your brass deflector on the A2. You've got a, a round button, you know, on your forward assist. This one is really, I think, maybe it's got a little cut out there that might indicate that's even older. Some of y'all that know a lot about these uh, can chime in there. Okay. And uh, 
so you got that uh we don't have a, a you know actual lower we got a more modern gun here but so we're we're empty of course uh you get a different uh you know uh, forearm on it of course you get your triangular versus your round uh, a lot of people prefer the triangular i kind of like the the round one and you got your uh, flash uh, suppressors you've got the bird cage of course uh, even on the a1 but you you don't have a solid bottom on it you notice it's probably hot i'm not going to touch it but on the a2 you got it solid so it acts a little bit like a compensator and plus you're not blasting dust up as much and that kind of thing and your sight uh post goes from a round post to a square post um, you know and there's other other differences but uh, you know pins and different things maybe but that's one of the the biggest your bolt let's look at the bolt real quick on this thing and I haven't gotten into any of that there's there's this you could spend 10 hours of course uh, talking about all these kinds of things how they change the bolts so there's so many changes uh, from like whatever 1950 uh, eight nine as they started with these up until like this A1 in 67, 68, so many different, almost everything on the firearm. Uh, the grip, you know, goes to a, where's my, you know, there's the, uh, my A2, you got a finger groove there. Uh, you know, you went from the teardrop on the uh, forward assist to the, just everything almost changed. The buttstock on the A2 uh, is longer. I'll put it up against the A1, you see there. It's an A2 buttstock. So you got a little more length there. The, it changed a little bit on the end. Uh, no limit to the number of changes. Like I say, the early bolts, many of them were uh, hard chromed. And they even changed the staking uh, uh, approach to it. Uh, uh, they changed the pin. This is a cotter pin. Uh, I think it's the same on this one too. But the really early ones were like a machined uh, uh, pin or screw there, some things like that. So. The firing pin early, very early on, was heavier, and they had a little bit of a problem with slam fires, so they lightened it to the firing pin that you're used to. So most of the things on this one and the course of these are things that you're accustomed to seeing, because I don't really have like a really early version, of course, like an XM, uh, you know, 16 uh, E1 or anything, or like the very first uh, Colt 601 that they came out with uh, once Colt had bought it. So. There, I really do advise you, if you have interest in these firearms, uh, you just dig around. There's a lot of great books on them, and if you have a lot of uh, interest in them. So, you know, the A2 is some improvements. The A2 is really nice. The Marines, I think, adopted it in 80, about 83. They're the ones who drove the, uh, the changes, I think, because they are riflemen. And uh, I, I don't say that in jest. I've known some, some folks in the Marines and I've shot with them and they know how to shoot. And uh, so this was kind of the Marines adopted this first, these changes, and then I, the Army a few years later. But they, when we, we have fired this with this upper, right? Yeah, this upper on it. Wow, it's really easy to control because you got heavier barrel on the A2, and one of the other changes I didn't mention. So, so you had some really nice changes uh, for the A2. That's what we're mostly uh, familiar with. And we brought out a, guess what? It's just, uh, it's just an M4. <laughs> so this is, this is the, what we have today, isn't it? And uh, it's interesting because they haven't changed dramatically since the 60s, have they? They look kind of the same, lower the upper, and well, they operate. The bolt, they're basically the same rifle they were you know, in the beginning, just with tweaks here and there. And uh, now we cut most of the differences, I guess, since what, the A2? have been, what did you do, start the fire going again? <laughs> Since the A2 what have been cosmetic, or just things that are make it more comfortable, and with grips and all kinds of stocks and and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the Magpul, I don't think Magpul was making magazines back, back in the day. And of course our red dots or whatever else we want to put on them. But very, very, very similar. This is a BCM in, uh, you yeah. know, they haven't changed a lot. Like I say, I'm not an expert in these things at all. I just like them, and uh, they're fun to shoot. The history is kind of interesting. If you, if you really uh, have just bought one of these, uh, I advise you to explore, do some reading. Like I say, the, the folks I recommended, and there are others, there are others that, that do a great job of laying out, and they have their hands on, or they build these things. There are people who have them that have built like the, the E1s and different E2s or whatever and uh, can go into the details of what's different exactly, right down to the pin, 
you know, how they began rubberizing, coating the sling swivels and just everything. So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. It just gives you more appreciation for what you have. And uh, I don't know if there's any other lies. I, I don't know any more lies. I'll shoot one more time and I'll let you go, okay? Can I empty one more mag? I know it's a bad time to be emptying magazines, but we're going to do it today because we have a machine gun, right? Put him on safe. We have a machine gun. You know, I'm going to make sure everything down here is uh, finished off. How's that? I just want to make sure there's no survivors down here. <laughs> All right. We're empty. So again, as I've said before, it's, it's really nice to be able to have a farm like this and fire it. Uh, it kind of speaks to freedom doesn't it and uh and you know uh i guess uh you know i'd like to say we really appreciate the people that have carried these in battle you know these and other firearms whether it's a, the grand up there or the m14 or whatever it might be or a muzzle loader to to make sure we're free and we have the freedom to do this kind of thing and uh, so uh, john and i have not served in the military and we uh we do not uh, pretend to be gi joes we just have an interest in firearms and we find these firearms very interesting and uh, just just uh, fun to shoot and uh, you know so anyway we appreciate that freedom and appreciate those folks who helped protect it for us so anyway m16a1 uh, that's just kind of an overview with uh, a smattering of uh, pieces of information uh, there's a lot out there, uh, probably more than uh, you're interested in, but it's out there. So I'm going to let you go. We appreciate your support. I know we've gone long, but that's not all that unusual for us, is it? I apologize. No, I don't. Life is good. Uh, fire. It's a long walk from where I had to shoot that. Oh, man. Oh, hey, didn't see you guys there. Since you're here, I want to let you know about our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall, talongungrips.com. Check out everything they have over there. You can get lots of different grips, the stick-on grip textures for your handguns and rifle grips, so go check them out. Also, Ballastall, they're a firearms lubricant or anything else you might need lubricating. Uh, it's water-soluble and non-toxic. Been using it on the compound and cleaning all of our guns. It's a cleaner and a lube for over 10 years. So Ballastall, Talon Grips, definitely check both of those companies out. And also, while you're on the internet, don't forget to go to Hickok45.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Hickok45, Twitter, Hickok45, Instagram, The Real Hickok45. And also, I have an Instagram page where I post behind the scenes stuff and different things like that. John, J-O-H-N underscore H-I-C-K-O-K-4-5 on Instagram. And uh, the next thing you have to do is watch more videos.